Good afternoon, and welcome back to the Gaisina Dialogue 2020. We are coming live to you from the Facebook studio. In our session today, we will be uh, discussing women leaders, peace and security, as the international community is celebrating the 20th anniversary of the 1325 United Nations Security Council Resolution and is taking stock of the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We will build on this topic and the other conversations in the Gaisina Dialogue 2020 that are relevant. Um, yesterday's panel, she leads um, in the Alpha Century, um, introduced us to the uh, topic of women, peace and security and how in this current environment, women are steadily cementing their leadership positions in the main halls. Today, we will also touch more broadly on the progress that women have made towards um, uh, equality, to gender equality in traditional male dominated environment such as politics, foreign affairs, defense um, and others. Beyond women in institutions and areas that allow building peace and security, noting particularly important um, the role, the, the involvement and participation of women in the democratic process, Today, we will focus on women as leaders. So it is my great privilege to introduce two exceptional members of our panel today to discuss their own experience and challenges and share with us their personal reflection on their journey. Her Excellency Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and member of the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid, and Her Excellency Marisa Ann Payne, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister for Women in Australia. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Elena. Former Prime Minister Clark, if you'll allow me, I'd like to start with, with you with a question that um, allows us to discuss the merits of women in peace and security in leadership roles primarily, um, including your experiences and reflections on the challenges that you have encountered in this um, uh, journey towards leadership in your own views. Well, every journey towards leadership is different, but uh, an important point to make at the beginning is I was the second of New Zealand's three women prime ministers. All of us came from all-girl families. <laughs> that tells me something. I myself grew up on a farm in New Zealand in the 1950s, and had there been boys in my family, the work on that farm would have been very segregated between girls and boys, but my father had no sons. So the girls did everything. So I grew up in an environment where I never knew that some people thought there were things that girls shouldn't do because we did everything. And then I went into an all girls uh, boarding school in a big city. Again, there was, there was no competition from boys. You, you just got on and did it, that was your world. And then I went on to university at a time when the baby boomers were coming through and the girls were there in as big numbers as the boys. But you began to notice that the world that I had known, where girls did anything and were there uh, in equal numbers, this didn't apply to the university staff. There were very few women. And so when I started going into what were considered non-traditional occupations, I became a university lecturer, one of very, very few, and then started on the political ladder, th there really weren't too many precedents. But because I think I'd had this, this family background that said anything's possible, you can do whatever you like, be whatever you like, uh, I had the confidence to do it. And that's uh, what I always convey to all younger women who I speak to. Believe in yourself, back yourself, because you can do it. Don't let people tell you that you can't. And I think I was just fortunate to have that particular background in those early years of women coming through. Uh, which didn't put those obstacles in my way then. Now, when I got onto the political ladder, believe me, it was extremely tough because I did run into a lot of people who didn't think women should be leaders of political parties at all and shouldn't be uh, prime ministers. And that's another whole long, long story. But, you know, you, you just have to build the resilience to deal with that. Maybe a follow-up question on, mm. on resilience and the power of example and maybe your experience as a mentor to... Um, other uh, women in your relevant fields of work and what you represented to them as a leader. Mm. Would you share some views on that? So on resilience, uh, I think still, uh, as a woman in politics in many countries, including my own, uh, women do attract a particular kind of criticism, and I see that levelled at our 
young woman prime minister in New Zealand now. But you have to uh, build the resilience to know that there is some criticism that just should be completely ignored because it's ridiculous and it's gender based and they are saying things they would never say about men. Uh, and you just have to build the alliances around you. This is true of anything in life. If you're on a journey towards the top, you need a team around you that's going to back you and that believes in you. Good if your family believes in you, if your husband <laughs> believes in you, but you, your colleagues must, be, must believe in you. So I very much emphasize it's not something you can do on your own as you go way up that ladder. You have to have a team of people around you and that will help build your resilience as well. Minister Payne, um, given your dual role as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, what has been your experience in leadership positions? And more broadly, what differences do you see when women are able to contribute to the decision-making process? I think that's a, a good question. I'm very fortunate to have that dual role. Uh, and it's a unique opportunity for me to bring together some really interesting uh, synchronicities between, or synergies, between uh, the work I do in foreign affairs and the work I do as Australia's uh, Minister for Women. Uh, in the part of the world in which Helen and I come from, uh, in the uh, Pacific in particular, uh, I'm passionate about encouraging women to participate in leadership roles mm -hmm. across many of our Pacific Island neighbours. Uh, there are some parliaments uh, which still don't have female representation mm -hmm. and uh, that is uh, uh, an important an important target uh, for me uh, to encourage, never to interfere, but to encourage and, uh, if you like, to, uh, to assure women in those countries that uh, uh, it's about the art of the possible and it is most certainly possible. I think what you need um, uh, in these jobs and I think the uh, Prime Minister, as Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, Helen has summed it up well. You do need that resilience, but I think we also need tenacity. You need to be tenacious in the way you go about uh, uh, this task in politics, uh, in public life, uh, and even uh, in, the, uh, in the public sector that supports us for women to rise to the highest levels of our public sectors uh, takes a similar degree of uh, tenacity for some. And these stories that I've heard over the years, some would uh, uh, some would uh, make your uh, blood boil uh, and some would warm your heart about uh, mm. those different paths. And they are all different. Mm. Uh, mm. Helen is also uh, correct about that. Mm. And in terms of the importance of having women involved in decision makings, in decision making, well, it is just basically logical. Uh, it is uh, short-sighted in the extreme at best and stupid at worst, I suspect, to cut out 50% of your population in the decision-making process, in the leadership process, in the development of policy, uh, and in contribution to, uh, to, uh, to life and to uh, the sorts of work that we're talking about here today. And for women, peace and security, uh, it is so important to have the contribution of women who experience some of the greatest vulnerabilities uh, in times of insecurity and in times of conflict uh, into restoring balance and to restoring peace and security to their communities. I'd like to follow up on, on this question, particularly um, in the role that women play in their communities. And this is a stereotype that we often hear that women have a, um, a, a one dimension type of role as, as mothers and as key pillars of their families. But you highlight, of course, that women leaders are significantly more in terms of their role as peace builders. And maybe you could elaborate on that from, from your own experience. Uh, I think uh, one very good example I would like to, uh, to use, uh, which is familiar from, uh, from our region, uh, is particularly in uh, uh, the most recent referendum in Bougainville, uh, a referendum which was agreed 20 years ago as part of the Bougainville Peace Agreement. But core to the Bougainville Peace Agreement coming into being all those years ago were women peace builders in those communities. And even now, just last year, I went into uh, rural parts of Bougainville, a long, a long way from, uh, from Buka, from the capital, uh, to sit down with women who had been part of building peace in their community over those two decades mm -hmm. and who were integral to ensuring that the referendum could take place mm -hmm. peacefully, constructively, uh, with the fullest possible levels of participation. And what I really appreciated seeing at the time uh, was that they were listened to, uh, they were heard, they were part of the discussion about how to build that referendum. Uh, I suspect in history that has not always been the case. So 
they're important steps. And, and I say that knowing, as I said, that it is still a challenge in the Pacific in particular uh, around the representation of women. Mm. Listening to you, both of you have highlighted um, from your experience the importance of resilience and tenacity. Um, mindful that we are uh, on a very short time, mm -hmm. I would like to um, invite you to offer an advice and encouragement for women in leadership roles or aspiring to leadership roles in the field of security and wider women who wish to be part of decision-making processes. Well. On the security front, I, I'm really thrilled that, that this dialogue, New Zealand's Deputy Chief of Navy, who is female, is here. I mean, this is a, this is a first for us. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And if you look at top roles in New Zealand society that women have never held, they've never got to be Chief of the Defence Force, or the Army, or the Navy, or the Air Force, or the police. So these are kind of the last frontiers. Uh, so to have role models like our Deputy Chief of Navy is, is really very exciting for all the young women who join the Navy and think, well, no, I'm not going to be sort of just left at that level. I'll never get further than captain or whatever. I, I can go all the way to the top. So I think it's so important uh, that there are visible role models of, of women's success. Some of us have provided those in, in politics, but we need them in the security forces. Now, I want to come back to a point that Maurice Payne made about the role of women as peacekeepers, which, which they did in Bougainville. They've done in Liberia. They've done in so many places. But when you come to review this 20th anniversary of uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, and then you reflect on what we see on the, the news coverage of peace negotiations, we still don't see enough women anywhere near that top table. You know, think of those long talks that went on uh, between the FARC and the Colombian uh, government. The women were never in the front row. You know, you look at these talks that go on and on and on for South Sudan. Where are the women? The women need to be brought forward. And I think, you know, if there is a natural role for women, it is as peace builders because they've kept the peace in the family, you know, that working in the community for cohesion. And those skills need to be able to be deployed and putting fractured societies back together again. And as Maurice said, it's women and children who have suffered the most in these conflicts. So they need to be heard when the peace is being built. They need to be a part of creating what the new society will be. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for Very well said. Yeah. Uh, but w we know statistically and empirically that uh, peace solutions and mm -hmm. resolutions of conflict that involve women uh, mm -hmm. in their development uh, are more likely to last longer than those that do not. There is actually mm. statistical and empirical evidence that assures us of that. Okay. So that in and of itself is an entirely logical reason to make sure that, mm. uh, that uh, we are engaging women in that process. It also helps to bind communities and to, to bind communities after extraordinarily difficult uh, mm. times. And I would absolutely agree with uh, Helen's observation about women in uh, leadership roles in the international and national mm. security space. Mm. Uh, a former Prime Minister of Australia uh, once stood up in front of the Australian Defence Force Academy uh, in Canberra and uh, told the young men and women who were uh, young leaders there at that academy the importance of having women in leadership roles was uh, in some ways about addressing the question of whether you can be what you can't see. Mm. Because uh, if you can see it, mm. you can be it. Mm. I'm immensely proud of Australian women like Major General Cheryl Pearce, who is the commander of the UN mission in Cyprus mm. right now. Mm. Only the second woman ever to command a UN mission anywhere in the world. If you're, a member of, uh, if you're a female member of an army anywhere in the world right now, then you can look at Cheryl Pearce and you can think about what is possible. Okay. Uh, there's a great story in Australian newspapers today about Major General Catherine Campbell, who has uh, just taken to the field in our civilian response in our bushfire uh, crisis mm. right now. Mm. Again, seeing people able to step up and do those mm. tasks are the sorts of women that you can aim to be, mm. sorts of leaders that you can aim to be. I find it immensely powerful. Mm. It's been fascinating listening to you so far. So before we conclude our discussion, would you like to share some final thoughts uh, in terms of the role of uh, women as leaders? I think we're in an era of some backlash against women. And, and that may reflect the fact that we've made quite a lot of progress and not everybody likes it. So you do have a, a pushback sometimes against uh, you know, the high water marks. Uh, but I think women just have to find allies among women and men, to keep pushing forward. Because as Marie said, it's a no-brainer. 
if you're not tapping all the talent of your society for leadership positions, whether it's in politics or education or the business community, the defence forces, whatever, you're never going to perform to your best. You need to use all the talent. Uh, so Hillary Clinton was once quoted as saying uh, that gender equality isn't just the right thing to do because it is a human right, but it's also the smart thing to do. Societies, businesses, economies, communities are better off when the women are able to play a full role. Thank you, Prime Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Eleanor, I think I would, what I would say is that conversations like this are so very important. Mm -hmm. uh, conversations which are part of a dialogue like Rosina, uh, which are part of uh, other dialogues held on uh, international security issues, uh, mm. on democracy uh, around uh, the world. I enjoyed taking part in the uh, Bali Democracy Forum in December last year, led by a female foreign minister in Indonesia, Retno Masudi, uh, where she ensured there was a panel of leading women uh, in, uh, in foreign affairs and in international roles uh, as part of that uh, conversation as well. So whilst there's a place for uh, panels such as this and these conversations are so important, uh, we also need to make sure uh, that it's not unusual, mm. that it's business as usual and mm. that uh, women who are in positions mm. of advantage mm. like Helen mm. and I mm. uh, are able to make uh, that part of the uh, mm. daily approach that we take yeah. to what we do. Mm. This has been a true inspiration. Uh, this concludes our panel. We thank you very much for your contributions and for joining us in this conversation. Thank you very much to all.